Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for blade lovers to learn about knives and knife collecting and to hear from the makers, manufacturers, and reviewers that make the knife world go round. I'm Bob DeMarco, and coming up, we're going to take a look at an oldie but goodie antique hearth knife from my collection, uh, Charity and Knives, and then we're going to get to a major grail that has come my way and some more new things that have come through. I've got, I've had an influx um, <clears throat> After a bit of a uh, a little lag, I've had an influx, influx of new stuff coming in, and I want to show it off. Uh, this will all have these will all have their own broken out videos in the future, but it's kind of an exciting uh, array of things. And one of those, I am so thrilled uh, to show off on this uh, very same podcast because it is an ultimate kind of lifetime grail uh, of both mine and my brother's. And he so generously got it for me. But first, you know what we do here first, a pocket check. Let's find out what I was carrying. And then let's let you tell me <laughs> what you were carrying today. Uh, we have some people here who carry six or seven knives at once. It's astounding. I mean, I always thought that I was, uh, you know, a junkie, uh, but six or seven, I say I should buy them knife junkie suspenders. Okay. First up in my pocket today was the Kubi. Yeah, that's right. The Kubi flash kind of an odd name to, for a, um, a black knife, but uh, you know, this comes in a variety of uh, colorways, etc. I opted for the black and the blacked out hardware and the blacked out blade minus that flat. I think that's kind of sharp, sort of a sharp look, sort of tuxedo oid, but a little more subtle than straight up black and, and white Cerakote. I really like this knife. I'm quite impressed by how uh, smooth it is, how amazing the action is. It's very sharp. D2 steel and and for the paces I've put it through so far, it's been totally fine. Uh, I take it on good word from my trusted sources and voices out there uh, in YouTube knife land. Kubis are, are, are some of the ones to beat. And so far, that has been my experience, too. I'm very impressed with this uh, $40 knife. And not for nothing, it's a looker. Feels great in hand, too. Uh, almost a four-inch blade. I like larger blades. And it's kind of funny how... When uh, new knife companies come out, at least some of these uh, Chinese knife companies, they're always making four inch blades first. They make large folders and then gradually they start to pare them down. I wonder why that is. I wonder if they think, oh, the American market must want huge knives because Texas. But uh, but then they realize, well, a lot of people like to carry things that are a little more, well, small and manageable. And uh and Kubi has definitely, I, I feel like they've kind of gone that route and they've maintained the cool, large stuff that I like, as well as make really interesting and very well-made smaller knives. Speaking of very interesting and uh, well-made smaller knives, uh, in my left pocket today was the modern, cla the instant classic, if you want to call it that, the uh, Rockwall by <clears throat> Tactile Knives. Now, they've come out with this knife in flipper format, as you see here. They've come out with it in a thumb stud format, which looks really, really tempting. And uh, now they're serving them up with Magna Cut, which, of course, is uh, is the outstanding, amazing kind of uber steel uh, derived. Uh, I mean, not, not derived, but uh, created by uh, Laren Thomas of knife steel nerds and of Laren Thomas steels. I mean, my God, he has revolutionized blade steel. You, you, uh, you gotta love that. I got to get my hands on a uh, one. Uh, I've, I've been taking a look at that Hogue, um, Deca, which I've, I haven't gotten yet, uh, you know, three years after its release. I I've always been interested in it, but now that it's, uh, you can get it in some really swirly, nice, um, shred carbon fiber with uh magna cut well now i'm tempted so i'm gonna i'm gonna have to check that one out all right and then lastly on my person today though not used thankfully uh was the spider co ronin an excellent excellent knife it's it's kind of interesting though um and uh michael janich the designer of this knife and also a uh uh, a, a muckety mucket spider co uh, told me about the sheath of this and um, 
well, let's get to the let's get to the knife first. The knife itself is BD1. It's uh, CTS BD1N steel, hollow ground, very thin and sharp, and and just kind of nasty. Just a nasty little uh, self defense knife. It is in between the Yojimbo two and the Yojumbo in terms of in, in terms of blade size, uh, but is shorter overall than the Yojumbo uh, due to its uh, handle. Look at how thin that handle is. It's just two very thin slabs of G10, peel ply G10 on the sides of this uh, knife. So very thin, very easy to carry close to the body as I like to. However, you look at the sheath and it's this giant pancake sheath and uh, the knife fits very well in it, uh, but the footprint of it is very large. And I keep promising myself I'm going to take it out to the grinder and get rid of this uh, quarter inch all the way around these grommets and bring it down. But I'll just I should just at this rate make my own uh, that's more customized to my carry preference. Now, due to mass producing these kind of uh, Bolteron or or, or Kydex or, um, you know, the thermal mold plastic sheaths with the vacuums in them and such, uh, I guess at Spyderco, they 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 need to kind of make them a little bit larger. So this is kind of this is maxing out my my uh, in the waistband carry. Luckily today I had uh, I had on a pair of what are these um, Duluth Trading Company with with some uh, expansion in the waist so I could wear this rather large sheath. I've just been lazy, haven't gotten around to make a new sheath for this, uh, but I, I think this is an awesome awesome knife and it's a very uh, well priced knife. It's pretty inexpensive and if you can wear fixed blades and if you like to wear fixed blades and you do a lot of utility stuff. This would be a nice light utility knife because of that uh, nice tip and that uh, super fine edge and hollow grind. Uh, so that's what I was carrying today. I had the Kubi Flash. I had the Rockwall by uh, Tactile Knives, and I had the Spyderco Ronin designed by our good friend Michael Janich. Uh, what an interesting and cool guy that guy is. Uh, tell me what, uh, that's one of the favorite interviews I've done. Let me know what some of the favorite interviews you've heard on the show who we've spoken with that you thought was uh, most interesting people are going crazy over dan keffler this week uh it was a very interesting interview and uh i'm excited people are excited about dan keffler call the listener line 724-466-4487 uh and yeah it's uh, number 307 uh for show notes to this show uh you can always check that out too uh Another thing you can do is check us out on Patreon. Now, um, Patreon is a special way you can help support the show. Uh, but at one level of support, the gentleman junkie level of support, that's $10 a month. Uh, you get entered every month into a knife uh, readopting, a, a knife adoption. Uh, look right here. This is what it is this month for the giveaway. It is the Harns Falcon. This is a blindingly good-looking knife, in my opinion. Uh, it actually kind of looks like a falcon, and this is sort of milling right here around the pivot collar sort of belies its inspiration. You know, it kind of looks like feathers and such. And that whole front of that of the blade uh, reminds me a little bit with, especially with this non-opening opening hole. I mean, you can't you can't really use that to open it, uh, but it is a. It is a flourish, and it lightens the blade a little bit. Uh, an awesome K110 blade, very thinly ground, and that wicked tip. This is uh, both an excellent utility knife in its uh, in where the tip is, kind of center line, but also with a little bit of belly uh, for good uh, utility cuts and such, but would also make an outstanding, well, great EDC knife, yes, but also an outstanding you know, kind of kind of feels really good in the hand. It has a great traction pattern, has a thin blade, nice point. Who knows? Who knows what, what you might use it for? I think it's a great all-arounder. I love this storm cloud blue. Is that what I'm calling it? No, Thunderhead Blue G10. It's that gorgeous gray blue color. I love it. I'm seeing it on a lot of knives, and I just love that color. It also has the same G10 as a backspacer, sort of gear pattern jimping it's a uh, it's actually pretty aggressive there less aggressive even than on the blade but the jimping on the blade is just how i like it uh like aggressive enough you know you know how that is it's it reaches the magic mean now if you ever have to flip this uh knife over and use it in this 
uh, grip, this reverse grip, you have an excellent platform for your thumb here. It's perfect, perfect. That's what I like. I like to see a little angle there for your thumb to curl over and you really get a tight purchase on that. And you could slam this into, uh, you know, that 55 gallon oil drum filled with Uzis and uh, not slip down on that blade uh, because of that nice uh, thumb engagement there. Uh, you've got a proprietary pivot, really nice knife, incredible action. Um, and this could be all yours if you uh, become a gentleman junkie you know, on Patreon, on the Knife Junkie Patreon page. Quickest way to go there is to go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon and give that a try. Just go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. And now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. Next up, we're going to talk about a man that we can all relate to. I know we can all relate to this. Okay, so I saw this on Knife News, where I get a lot of my knife news. You got to go over there and check them out. Uh, if you haven't already, I know you have. Uh, the man who holds the record for the largest knife collection in the world, yeah, and Guinness certified it, is planning on doing a giant uh, charity auction just one year after his... Uh, after his world's record was certified. Uh, his name is Luis Bernardo Mercado, Mercado and uh, he made history with an enormous personal knife collection, 2,175 knives. Now, that almost, I, I'm i going to be totally honest here, and, and, and I'm going to say when I read that number, 2,175, probably like you, you were a little disappointed or maybe surprised. I was like, I was expecting someone who had the world's record for a knife collection was more than that. Because if I keep this up at my current rate and live to, uh, you know, a ripe old age, I might just have more. No, I don't think so, uh, because I will do some giveaways and some sales before then. Uh, but I, I love this story. This guy is going to take uh, a majority of his knives, he says, and you can imagine a majority of his knives getting rid of them will leave him with plenty. And he's going to sell them alongside fine art, field tools, and other collectibles at the Calveras County Art and Knife Charity Estate Sale, which sounds like a place I want to go to. Uh, not only for the knives, I love old tools, and uh, that would be sounds like a ball. I mean, so this guy is selling everything from Benchmade's Buck, Medford's, custom knives, Microtex, Marfione, Sogs, Ratwork, Gerber, everything from just like many of our collections, some real high end, some real low end, some custom even. And uh, when asked and pressed, what is he going to keep? He He's going to keep that 110 folder that he's always loved, uh, a couple of Hawk knives and an Andre Thorburn, and then several other hundred. So there you go. Uh, check it out if you're in Calaveras County, uh, October 15th, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, that's in, in a few months, so you can save up. So check that out. I love that. Knives going to charity. And I also love this. Wait, I, I'm sorry. One more thing. There's a quote from here that will ring true to all of you. He says, I have not yet settled on which exact knives to keep, though I know for sure a few custom OTFs will be in the 100. He's keeping 100. And then he says, every knife is special to me, so it will be hard to let any of them go. <sighs> and I know how he feels. I mean, it's kind of like Sophie's Choice. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, but there you go. I, I can understand the, the whole quandary with letting knives go out of a collection. Once you've let yourself go to get to the point where you have this massive sprawling collection, then you have to figure out what you're going to let go. And, uh, you know. That can be very, very hard. Uh, speaking of charity, Bob Terzawola has created a beautiful version, one-off of uh, his style tactical knife with the four-inch blade and a hollow ground, slightly recurved clip point with a giant swedge. And uh, he is going to be uh, lotterying this off to help Ukrainian refugees. Uh, it is a beautiful knife. You see it's got a carbon fiber show side. Uh, sort of contoured, and then it's got a blasted titanium lock side. But the real um, sort of collectible part of it is that backspacer, a split yellow and blue backspacer uh, out of G10. 
to signify uh, the Ukrainian flag. So no doubt a masterpiece in a very, very usable tactical slash utility folder. But no doubt the person who gets this will be locking it away uh, because it's a one off and it is a very special, special knife. Uh, you can go to the Terzawola website and uh, that's on April. Let's see. When is that going to be? Uh, oh, well. I guess we're late. <laughs> so you can't you cannot join this uh, now. That is over. Uh, but this is something that has uh, has just happened. And we have not gotten the final price on what they earned uh, to give to Ukraine. I do apologize. I had this uh, I had this when it was pertinent and it got pushed. And then I really wanted to showcase it. So uh, there you go. You have the knife community uh, all over the place, selling knives, making knives to benefit people, uh, whether it's through a local auction or whether it's through this very important uh, lotto. Uh, tickets were uh, 25 bucks, you know, tickets to enter this lottery were 25 bucks. So I hope they made a mint. I'm sure they did. Uh, to help the Ukrainian refugees. Okay, still to come on uh, the Knife Junkie podcast, we're going to get to the state of the collection where I have an oldie but goodie I want to show off that I can't believe I have never shown. And then we're going to talk about eight new implements I've gotten, seven new implements I've gotten through here recently that uh, bear mentioning are very interesting. We'll have their own breakout videos. And a couple of these here are, I've been waiting for them for so long that I just have to show them right now all coming up on the knife junkie podcast and now that we're caught up with knife life news let's hear more of the knife junkie podcast okay oldie but goodie i love the oldie but goodies uh sometimes i forget i look around this room and you can see some of the things on the wall behind me uh, if you're watching right now but there are things on other walls as well not not so much like the wall of fame here but uh, quite a few other things and one is something that I forget that I have, and I kind of just I lose it, and I'm blind to it. Uh, and it's something Vic, my brother, got me a while ago. Um, I, I told him, if you're ever in your in your wanderings, you come across an old Bowie knife, you know, let me let me know. And he he found this here. First of all, this is the sheath he made for it because it didn't have a sheath, uh, but a thing of beauty. My brother is very talented. Anything he touches. Uh, he he's like a master. He masters it. And uh, he's one of those guys. And this was one of his very early uh, leather projects. And uh, glad he made it. This uh, allows me to put it on my belt in a sideways cant, which I prefer. But this is a big I'm calling it. It's not quite a Bowie knife. It is in uh, a clip shaped blade here. It's kind of long. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to it's about a 16 inch, 17 inch blade. I'm going to put the tip off the edge. And show the handle for a second. This uh, he found out in Amish country uh, at an old uh, like gun and uh, curio shop uh, out in Ohio. And what I and I'm calling it a hearth knife because it reminds me of the German Messer knives uh, from sort of uh, the Renaissance and 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 uh, well, I guess yeah, the Renaissance and after that in Europe uh, when people you know. Swords are expensive and only noblemen in a lot of cases had swords, but people still needed blades and they made these immense uh, messers, the German word for knife. They called them messers, but they were, you know, like short swords with big handles and uh, capable of handling many, many chores around the house and hearth and then also could be used as a defensive weapon. And I'm not sure if that's what this was. That's what I'm kind of calling it though because it looks like a giant doesn't look so much like a weapon to me it just looks like a giant utility knife that would be used for uh you know very much as a machete it's nice and thin this was made from a saw blade like one of those two-man saw blades where where there's a, a post on either side and a long saw in the middle that's very flexible and that, that has big gnarly teeth and they go back and forth and saw through giant logs. That's what this was made out of, if you believe the guy who sold it to my brother. And I have no reason not to. Uh, but made at home by someone named... I, I forgot the name here. Jerry Anderson. That's right. Look at this. Jerry Anderson right there on the in script, a beautiful script etched into this uh, Ricasso here. Um, 
if you can call it a ricasso and i don't and i don't mean that a snotty way it's just uh you know this this is so thin that really all it took was kind of a convexing of the edge uh, at about a third of the way towards the edge so it's not a big uh you don't see much of a ricasso here at all actually uh, or or a flat there beautiful brass guard very large uh, you can imagine if your hands get sweaty or doing a lot of work or they get dusty and you've got leather gloves on might slip around a bit you definitely don't want to come up onto this very sharp blade by the way this is quite sharp um and the handle itself is pretty cool it's a two scales sandwiching uh the full width of that blade you can see how much of it was kind of uh, thinned out here look at how thick it is here it's a quarter inch thick here and over here it's nice and thin so that was deliberate um but i love this it's sort of an inset double arrow it's kind of mysterious i don't know what it means over here you just have the the uh back side of the nuts there but what is that what does that mean those that double arrow they went to a, a pretty decent effort to um route out that shape that double arrow shape and then make a piece to fit in there i wonder what it means uh is it a brand is that someone's brand for their farm or something i don't know that's what i love about these old knives the old knives on the wall behind me this old knife the one i'm going to show you uh in a few minutes uh, that's what i love about them you don't know what the story is behind them and uh you can you can do your research and then you can extrapolate and then you can just imagine and that's that's kind of the bittersweet beauty of it is that you never will find out the answer. Um, it, I'm sure there are rare exceptions with knives that have numbers on them or maybe, you know, real, real special one of a kind type things. But for these kind of average person uh, knives and swords and that kind of thing, you're never going to know. And that mystery is part of the thrill, I think, of the collecting. So an oldie but a goodie. I'm going to hold it up here for those watching so you can see the kind of the scale of it big big very flexible i mean i can bend it right here so uh meant for machete work meant for probably hewing uh or not hewing but uh cutting down grasses and and wheat and that kind of stuff i don't know so there it is beautiful sheath putting this down here and uh uh, I'm going to refresh uh, the show every once in a while with some more oldies but goodies because I have them and they deserve uh, to be taken out. And also when I do that, I remember things and I, I like to do that. All right. So now let me show you some of the knives I have, uh, some of the new things I have in uh, right now for review or just for my collection that I'm extremely excited about. And uh, the first thing is a Gerber knife. Now I am not. I'm not saying I'm extremely excited about this Gerber knife. What I am saying is Gerber, Gerber sent this to me to check out and get me excited. And so I am going to give this a, a, uh, a you know, a nice testing and I'm going to carry this for a while and see how I like it and be uh, uh, really, really, um, you know, I'm going to really do my job with this one, so to speak, because it's fighting an uphill battle because it's a Gerber. It's the Gerber affinity in copper. Now, uh, Gerber saw, excuse me, Gerber saw my review of the, uh, <laughs> of their new one that I really like in red, uh, uh, an inexpensive knife. I'm sorry. It'll come to me in a minute. I got it for 20 bucks and I think it's incredible for what it is. Now it's current execution is very cheap, but it's only $20 but it still has great action, great blade shape, great ergonomics, and great potential to be uh, a, a knife that could pull Gerber out of its slump and really uh, thrust it to the forefront. Kind of like, um, and to me, it, it would be, it, its competitors would be something like the bug out. Uh, thin, light, great blade shape, and all that. Well, they saw that review, they liked it, and so they said, hey, can we send you this? And I said, sure, send it. Uh, and it's copper which I like. And uh, so this is the copper Gerber Infinity. They also have one in um, aluminum. Straight off the bat, uh, I was like, oh, that, that blade looks funny. It's a little skinny uh, for the handle, but um, it does give you a very slender profile when it's, when it's folded up. Um, 
and it is a hollow ground blade of what is this it is d2 i believe and so d2 that's a good uh improvement for gerber for sure in terms of blade steel definitely i mean the uh the other gerber that i was just talking about was a was a was like a three CR or something. Oh no, it was a seven CR. And uh, so somewhat capable, but really, you know, aim and low. Uh, with D2, you're way in a better spot. Uh, and so immediately the looks of this, I gotta say, I do like, because that D2 sort of demands a coating. So you got that nice black coating. And then this copper is really nice. I, I, I have never had a copper knife. I've always, wanted one but the the weight or what i perceived the weight to be uh, always kind of turned me off but having this in hand and this is a steel lock uh steel frame lock here with copper and uh, of course a steel blade it's not that heavy um and this this knife here comes in with a three and a half wait one two three yeah it's a three and a little bit more than three and a half inch blade and like I said, it's not really that heavy. Uh, aesthetically, uh, like I said, my initial thought was that blade's too skinny, but then the hollow ground won me over. So that I don't really see anymore. Um, I, I see a sleek knife. I do like the copper. I like the attempt at interest here with the uh, D-shaped pivot on this side with their, with their Gerber logo there. Uh, this side is also interesting. Reminds me a little bit of... Uh, how they did the lock bar over travel on the their clevery one. Oh man, all of these Gerber names are are escaping me now. Uh, you know which one I'm talking about, though. It was their breakout hit a couple of years ago. That looks like a cleaver. They did that same thing. They put the plate uh, over the lock bar so that you can't overextend it, and then they put some designs on it as a flourish. Uh, immediately, something here strikes me that I don't like design wise and I'll, I'll point this out here now again as i mentioned these are all going to get full reviews but these are sort of initial takes on a few of these knives and uh and one thing i see here that i don't like is the way this clip or, or the way this piece of copper uh is not parallel to this chamfer line it starts closer here and it widens out a little bit here and it's fine. Obviously, it doesn't affect anything, but it doesn't seem deliberate. Now, looking at it, it is deliberate because there is an inset. There is a, a milled out portion for that to rest in. So, I mean, they did mean it, but something about that sticks in my craw ever so ever so slightly. But that's only an aesthetic thing. That's a taste issue. And I'm not even saying good taste versus bad taste. I'm just saying my taste does not like that. I My eye wants to see it parallel. Um, really nice in reverse grip if you're if you need it like that and also reverse reverse grip uh if you need that but this isn't that kind of knife it is solid enough to be that kind of knife though uh but if you were to use this in any sort of tactical situation uh which they don't intend this for this is a gentleman's folder for them it's like a larger gentleman's folder for them actually if you read the affinity write up on the website they they go into some you know some they write a little literature you know it's uh they get a little flowery uh flowery with the language which yeah, i appreciate but uh uh yeah a gentleman's folder but if you were to to use this for self-defense or or out in in the rain in the woods it, this handle would be slippery I, it might even be a nightmare i don't know very nice pocket clip i do like that that pocket clip it works very well uh i thought it would be badly positioned near that scoop out but it isn't you have the the barrel spacers very nice and then lastly uh the big one of the big usps of this knife is the pocket clip whoa i'm off camera sorry that pocket clip right here it has a uh torx bit there i mean a torx screw there and you can slide this and tighten it down and move that clip back and forth down that slot to accommodate your own hands and your taste in, in ergonomics. And I think that that is very considerate. But I got to say, and I'm, I know I will say this, this will be a sticking point in my review, is uh, if you're concerned about ergonomics enough to create a system 
where you can loosen the thumb stud and slide it up and down a slot, well then make sure that your lock bar, uh, where you put your thumb to disengage that lock bar, isn't thin like a razor and painful to disengage. And you know, I, sometimes I, I bristle at talking about discomfort on a knife because I'm like, I'm a knife guy, I should be tough. And, but no, 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 no. This, this, you want this knife to break in and be super smooth and fidgety like the other Gerber I just had, whose name I can't, oh, the Zilch, the Zilch. Go back and every time I said I couldn't remember, just fill it in with Zilch. Great knife. Uh, has awesome action that took very little time to develop. Uh, this one I feel could, but could get that action and will get that action, but it's not a pleasure to disengage that lock bar. As a matter of fact, it's kind of a buzzkill. You end up using your, your thumbnail and not realizing it or trying to do and not press your, your even calloused thumb flesh against they like thin it out and make it even thinner right at the edge i don't quite understand that uh bit of design and and i'm i'm pretty sure i mean like look you have a very short lock bar here here's the relief cut okay i said this wasn't going to be a full review and it's not but there's the relief cut it's halfway down the scale that means the tension on this lock bar feels higher and and then you make it sharp on that lock bar and it's a little painful, but I, I will soldier on. I do like this knife. I, I want to like this knife. I'm rooting for this knife. And I think, I, I think that it's going to be, I think it's going to be good. I, I just think it's going to take a little bit of breaking in. And, uh, like I've been patient with other, uh, more expensive knives like Emerson's, which require, you know, uh, a, 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 a nearly, well, a, a disheartening break in period where you're like, my God, what did I do? And then suddenly it blossoms into this wonderful, you know, out of its adolescence into a wonderful full fledged knife. It could happen with this Gerber. And I'm going to I'm going to make sure that I know whether it, it can. And I think it will. I can I think I can already tell. It's just that disengaging that lock is pain right now. But I'll get tough to it. All right. Next up is the Bronte. Now, I did. I have done a full review on this Bronte. Now, that is a Sen Cut knife. My very first Sen Cut knife. What is who is Sen Cut, you ask? No, you don't. You, you're all the ones who told me. I was like, Sen Cut? Who's this new Sen Cut? And uh, someone let me know. Yeah, it's uh, Civivi's uh, downstream or, or, you know, high value brand. And it is very high value. This was a uh, $45 knife. I bought it on looks alone. I think it is a beautiful, beautiful blade. And I love the neutral handle altogether. The overall profile of this knife, I think, is really, really nice, really appealing. And it's very thin, very sharp. That point is awesome. Uh, scares me a little bit, but I think maybe I've outgrown the dropping knives on the tip thing maybe i'm out of that phase i don't even want to say that because you know you know how luck works but uh really really nice the the action on this is not what i was expecting i was expecting fall shut civivi action this is not this is definitely you know i need to use my fingers to close it this is uh on bearings i took this apart i oiled it uh you know, cleaned it. It didn't need much cleaning. I thought maybe there was some gunk in there or something. It wasn't clean as a whistle, uh, but just not, not fall shut smooth. And you know what? I don't need fall shut smooth, but I always thought that on bearings, you would, you would always get that. And without, without tightening both sides of that pivot to get, uh, to get just the right tension for flipping it out, um, and to get no blade play, uh, I just couldn't quite adjust it and have it come back in so that it it falls. Like, say, this right here, this Harns. See that? Just drops right in. On bearings takes, uh, you know. This one, not so much. But I still really much like this knife. Uh, I can even front flip it using my, my forefinger, which makes me feel like I'm part of... <laughs> 
<laughs> part of the club. Uh, I used to say, oh, I can't front flip. And then I realized, hey, Bob, you're rejecting new technology. This makes you sound like an old fart. And so, uh, you know, really, it's not that hard. It's that the engineers didn't have it right until now. That's what it is. It's the engineer's fault. This send cut to me is sort of uh, reminiscent of the uh, that big Chinese two handed Chinese war sword with the ring. Um, it's it, it looks like a lot of different things. It reminds me a little bit of a straight razor, uh, a lot of a worn cliff with a belly, uh, just a wonderful knife. And I've I've really grown to like it. I'm carrying it. Not grown. I liked it since the moment I got it. And and the action doesn't bother me. So. Um, been carrying this with me every day, kind of uh, in a tertiary, secondary or tertiary role and getting that uh, micarta nice and funky. All right. Next up is from a company called Station Nine. Station Nine is a company that is uh, developed to came into being to reproduce weapons uh, that the resistance, the French resistance and other European resistance outfits uh, against the Nazis in World War II used. Uh, everything from, um, well, in, in the case of Station 9, everything from big knives. Uh, or they have a big knife based on uh, the sort of butcher knife that people repurposed into tactical knives in uh, World War II. It's a really nice looking thing. I think that's their number one. And they also have a couple of small sneaky knives. And I'm going to show you one of those right now. This is a classic that I've seen many, many times in, in different books, uh, especially that weapons book I talked about last week. Uh, this is the Station 9 Number 4 OSS lapel dagger. Um, they just call it the lapel dagger, but I know it was developed for the OSS the Office of Strategic Services, the precursor to the CIA. And lapel dagger, of course, they didn't use Kydex sheath. They had a little leather sheath. But this thing was sewn under the lapel of a sports jacket or, or of an overcoat. And in a pinch, in a real pinch, you'd remove it and you have a super sharp double-edged blade there. And, uh, you know, maybe you need to stick it in someone's carotid to make a quick getaway, you know, jump on their motorcycle and, uh, you know, jump a fence back into your territory, whatever it is. Uh, this is a last ditch, obviously last, last, last ditch, but also super low profile weapon to have on you. Let's see if I can get this to. There you go. Station nine reminds me a little bit of that. Wii that came out not too long ago, uh, that little, uh, double-edged we i think they were kind of probably thinking of something similar now according to the station nine folks there's some pretty uh cool looking dudes uh some hardcore uh guys uh they show off how to use this thing i'm gonna i'll show it over here um they have a bunch of different uh, holds to it but basically they they do a cord like this uh where it's tied off in a couple of knots there and you can carry it in your maybe not purple maybe you'd want black or something so it doesn't attract attention but you can kind of carry it around in your palm like this and then you can flip it out like this and have it pinched between your thumb and finger it's just a very small surface here that you pinch the handle there uh but it's really aggressively jimped so you can you can you don't even need a cord and you can pretty much hold on to this and stab cardboard uh cardboard of course is not a resisting man in a leather jacket but it is a an indication that you can hold on to it somewhat but if you have that cord in your hand and you have it uh, braced against your finger you can really go to town with this thing and uh it's a just a cool little great very razor sharp uh weapon little little tiny knife but that i mean the weapon part of it is the historical part of it but it makes an excellent drop in the pocket knife I've had it also riding in my pocket a lot and kind of forgetting it's there, like literally forgetting it's there, not just, oh, it's so late, you forget it's there. And then uh, at some point in the day, I pull something out. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. I, I have this sneaky little knife here, sneaky little dagger. And uh, there are a couple of different famous patterns of those little OSS oh. lapel daggers, but that's the most famous, I think, that double-edged one. I'm really psyched they made it. Next up is... 
part of a growing obsession. Uh, this really got my uh, got me going when I saw this. Station Nine makes these. Uh, this is their number three, the Knuckle Duster. And if you look here, it's cast aluminum with the finger holes, and then it had does not have a palm brace. Uh, a lot of a lot of traditional knuckle dusters have a palm brace something that extends down into the palm that you push against <clears throat> that that gives you backing and solidifies it in your hand now i'm going to say right off just in testing the mcneese uh, knuckle dusters and then these knuckle dusters without the right fit and without gloves like i would only use these if i had a certain pair of gloves that i have on you could really mess up your hands i think uh, maybe maybe it's Maybe it's my lack of um, experience, or maybe it's the fact that I've been testing these out on a heavy bag, and maybe in a dynamic situation, punching a person is less bad. But I just feel like, you know, uh, how we talk about the ring knives and how dangerous they could be for your fingers. Well, this is kind of times four um, in, in a way. And I would also imagine if I were to get a, one of these made custom, I would have it smaller. Uh, these would definitely fit in big, much bigger hands than than mine. So maybe the fit also uh, is a factor in why it hurts to use these unless you have gloves on underneath them. Uh, but in any case, if uh, it's a devastating little arc here with the four holes, uh, no palm brace, and four nubbins that stick out just to menace. I mean, they talk about full, uh, force multipliers. If you didn't have those, they'd be devastating enough to get hit with. But you add those protrusions, and man, it just complicates things uh, exponentially. The weight, this is aluminum. It's very light. These I've had in um, a light jacket pocket, my right pocket, for a couple of days. I lost it, actually. Where's the damn? And it was in my pocket. I forgot about it because they're so light. How does that affect the traditional role of the brass knuckle to, or the knuckle duster to uh, accentuate a punch? It's not just with hardness, but also with weight. Uh, well, in this case, I don't think you get much of that weight factor. You get hardness and you get menace. You get uh, nastiness in those uh, little spiky protrusions, but you're not getting that uh, real extra added mass that that might add to the wallop um i don't know this is a developing theory <laughs> you know these kind of important topics need lots of thought and lots of uh you know hypothesizing and such so right now that's kind of how i feel so that means to to really work this out uh in a in a well in a responsible way i it means i have to get brass knuckles made of brass i gotta get knuckle dusters made of brass and perhaps other materials just to see how they work out now i know uh um, i have uh, heard of people making them out of wood exotic woods and such and uh who knows so maybe i have to go uh, go down this this rabbit hole what do you think probably so Next up is a knife I've wanted ever since I saw it, and uh, it's it seems to have just been restocked. I think this company makes smallish batches of their stuff. Only ever had one of these once before a long time ago. Got rid of it. Kind of wish I didn't, uh, but that was an old knife. I don't think they make anymore. Anyway, this one is the Sandstorm K by Max Ace. Max Ace is a company that I guess until maybe a year ago, we heard about, and they made knives available from time to time, but I have a feeling that unless you were kind of keyed into Max Ace uh, as a real fan, it was kind of catch as catch can. Now I think they've gone wider. Am, am I right about that? Am I wrong? Leave a comment. Let me know what you know about Max Ace. Uh, the Sandstorm K is the K110 and G10 version of their Max Ace Sandstorm, which is a more fancy well first of all it's a it's a large frame lock a titanium frame lock folder like this and the blade has the same profile but it has a much more exotic treatment with a giant fuller and some interesting um, grinding and such uh, but this is really appealing to me you've got that double peaked or double humped bowie shape that i like so much that was made um, initially made popular by the mac v sog bowie 
Uh, this, of course, does not look so much like the Mac VSOG Bowie, but it has that spirit in the spine, and I do love that. I'm going to do a show here soon featuring just knives that feature this double humped spine thing and why I like them so much. This is a big knife. Look at this. This is no shrinking violet. We've got one, two, three, four, and mm, 4.6 inch blade. I mean, they say four and a half, but uh, yeah, we'll call it four and a half inches. This is a big knife. It's even bigger. Uh, it's bigger in blade than the um, Bastinelli Big Drago Tack. And it sits proudly next to it now in my in my case. I love this thing. I have carried it a number of times. It's probably too big for many people, and it's too big for certain garments of mine. Of course, I would never wear this in dress pants or anything like that. Uh, it's okay in khaki pants. It's it's definitely okay in like uh, a stretchy tactical or work pants like the ones I'm wearing right now. Jeans, it's a no go. It's too much. It's too too thick. That's like a a uh, uh, six and a uh, point six five thick here. It's heavy. It's like a seven ounce or seven and a half ounce here. And in the front, you know, when, when you wear a knife in the front pocket of your jeans and it's too big, it kind of feels like it's right on top in front of your leg. This is not so comfortable in the jeans, but everything else, uh, it's been great. You've got this nice thumb ramp, really great ergonomics and a lot of room. If you have big honking hands, this would be a great knife for you. Um, you've got two pretty subtle finger grooves here and then this giant area here where you can just fill that in and then an extra ramp here for your freakishly large hands uh, your pinky can rest there uh, you've got sort of a rock not a rock pattern sort of an, a, a modified uh, anzo pattern in the g10 nice concentric circles uh, um, thingy here Pivot, I'm sorry, <laughs> pivot, and a K110 blade. Very, very fine at the edge, very broad blade, and flat ground. So this thing comes to nearly a zero edge. I would imagine they ground that to a zero edge and then put that, that backed it up a little bit and put that final cutting edge on because it comes to such a fine behind the edge um, uh, dimension there. Very comfortable here with the back thumb swedge or thumb ramp and then also comfortable up here they give you some other jimping right there two different kinds of jimping neither of them aggressive enough uh if you ask me which you haven't but i knew you would so i just head you off at the pass there i would i would make the the both sets of jimping just a little bit more grabby uh it's like the, it was cut and then and then tumbled and then polished and it feels like it just sort of lost some of its some of its kunj, but uh, it probably doesn't matter because of the ergonomics and the sharpness and the uh, acuity of the point and all that stuff. Uh, here we've got uh, one of those annoying kind of roto block things here, but it doesn't really bother me. I don't feel it in either, you know, in either hand, and it, it has yet to automatically engage on me. It's not supposed to, and it only would if I turned it by accident with my hand. So all good there. The pocket clip is leaves me slightly cold, I'll be honest. At least it's subtle. At least it's not leaving me cold because it's overbranded and, and gaudy and stupid. But they could have done, I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't quite seem proportionate. It seems like it needs to be a little wider. But uh, just, just aesthetically speaking. Otherwise, it works great in and out of pocket and keeping it where it needs to be in the pocket. Action is outstanding. Uh, access to the lock bar is awesome. Disengagement of the lock bar is great. Obviously, no play. Obviously, on bearings and the weight of that bl giant blade really, uh, well, really gets that thing moving. So I'm very psyched about this Max Ace. I look forward to kind of daily carrying a nice big knife again. I haven't carried something that large uh, consistently for a while. So I'm sure I'll carry that consistently for a few weeks. And then have to get the Goliath, the Max Ace Goliath, which I think is also very large. Uh, I think the name is what tipped me off to the Goliath. Okay, next up is something we've been waiting for. A lot of us have been waiting for for over a year. And it's so exciting that the time has finally come. And that is the first Jack Wolf Knives 
knife. And it is here. I'll show it to you first in this leather pouch. Um, very nice. It ships with this leather pouch. Uh, that's the logo. Love that wolf logo. Both my wife and I have the Jack Wolf Knives Wolf, just the wolf head on our cars because we both like it so much. Uh, I for the knives and for Ben and for the logo. My wife just because she likes the logo. So there you go. I can't argue against that. Can't argue with that. So this is the Sharpshooter Jack. Man, is it beautiful. But I, I, I'm sorry. I'll reserve all comments. You can make your own judgment. Um, this is a gunstock jack. You can tell by the shape of the handle there. Looks like a gunstock. It's also a very ergonomic grip. A lot of, uh, there are some very famous gunstock grip knives. Here's the, the 44. You can see that same shape by GEC. Uh, makes for a very comfortable knife, but this one has that extra blade, so you don't get to really uh, benefit from the contours of that gunstock. Here you get full access to that gunstock grip. And what and what Ben Belkin, the owner and proprietor of this country uh, com company, who has worked so hard to make this happen, make this a reality, um, he has redesigned, put some of his own English on the on his knives because he is a high end slip joint collector and has distilled like many others has distilled out all of what he thinks a knife should be into his designs. He's got about eight designs and I've, uh, I've had the pleasure of pawing some of the prototypes, but now I have the true pleasure and honor of owning one of these Jack Wolf knives, which uh, they're, they're going wide at a number uh, of distributors, uh, a good number of distributors on the 15th of the month, 15th of April. Tax day. Do yourself a favor. Buy yourself a Jack Wolf knife on tax day because you deserve it. You deserve it. Okay, so let's take a quick look at this knife. This has. Uh, we'll we'll start at the at the uh, handle area. As I was mentioning, he put his own special little ergonomics, like the some of the uh, slight curves on there, um, to the profile of the handle. But the bolsters and the liners are integral pieces of titanium one piece of titanium here carved out the bolster and the liner and then that small area for the cover uh, in the slip joint world we call scales covers so this cover was put down here in this little notch milled out of this liner so it's uh, the bolsters and the liners are integral to one another uh, a little different from integral in the in the folding locking knife world where it's milled out of one piece of titanium. Unlike that, this is a slip joint. So it has the steel spring uh, coming up the back here, beautifully, perfectly, seamlessly mating up with the blade. So nice. Um, the handle here, uh, before I move forward to the blade, these covers are um, fat carbon and it's called blue dark or dark matter blue. Uh, so it's sort of a shred carbon fiber there, marbled, and they threw some of that beautiful blue in there. And, you know, I've been kvetching for years about carbon fiber and how boring it is. But the 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 industry heard me, you know, and they caught up with interesting things. And uh, I love all of these sort of swirly, interesting, marbled and shredded carbon fibers, um, much more than those basket weave carbon fibers. Those just bore me. They bore me, but this is just gorgeous. Blasted titanium, unlike most, um, you can you can adjust the pivot there. And then we move north to that, or I guess that's west. We move west onto the blade, and it's that beautiful clip point, traditional clip point shape. Full height hollow grind. Full height hollow grind. Comes to a wicked thin behind the edge. Uh, geometry. I mean, just crazy thin behind the edge. That's M390, people. M390 with a beautiful satin, machine satin finish on it and a nail neck where it belongs, just on one side. And that Jack Wolf Knives logo. This is uh, um, a great knife. This is a great knife. Uh, if you like slip joint knives and you want something, I mean, mm, Ben has taken two years coming up with these things. He has worked 
he has worked and he has tried and he has prototyped and he has dialed it in to a, a, ma a production masterpiece. So that's my way of saying it. If you like these this style of knife, keep your eye on Jack Wolf knives. They are launching on April 15th with the first model. Uh, and that's this sharpshooter Jack. But they got he has a number of other models up his sleeve and they're all cool. They're all beautiful. Uh, this one comes in this fat carbon fiber and then three flavors of canvas micarta, black, natural, and green. Plus, I'd be remiss if I didn't show you this. Comes in a soft touch box. Oh, yeah, that's nice. But look at this. Comes in an, alum in an aluminum tube with original artwork. He contracted a uh, very accomplished co uh, comic book artist to create characters, wolf characters, for each one of his uh, knives. This is the sharpshooter, so you see a sniper wolf here. Pretty cool. You unscrew this, you get uh, one of these. Is this called a pog? Someone, someone younger than me, tell me. You get one of these in the top, and I know people are psyched about this. Uh, I think it's sort of a trading card kind of thing or something uh, that... Um, uh, you tell me what that is. Pog? or something and uh it the knife itself comes wrapped up in this awesome uh branded microfiber orange cloth blindingly orange cloth and then uh, you get a sticker in there and just amazing packaging and ben is very adamant that part a large 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 part of the experience of collecting and also you know receiving and collecting knives is the packaging and boy he got that down right i feel like he's done this whole thing right slow and steady wins the race my friend so really well done i'm looking forward to uh, a breakout video of this one for sure and had a great time using it in the woods this past weekend all right we've gotten to the grail this thing i've wanted since i was a kid so did my brother um ever since that weapons book and ever since i discovered this thing and um, he finally got his hands on one, and he said it was very, very, very hard parting with it. But here it is. It is the U.S. 1918 trench knife. This thing is a very hard knife to come by. If you want an original, if you want something uh, from back in the day, uh, you're going to search long and hard like my brother did. And he wanted one with the especially pointy spikes and held out and finally got one i'm going to show this with the sheath first it's a metal sheath that's spring it has two four points of spring tension uh these are sort of pressed into the into the path of the blade and they keep it in there kind of like a bayonet sheath when you remove it this is the knife this is uh it's breathtaking okay let's talk about it it's a molded bronze handle cast bronze handle here and then you've got the signature um, pointy grommet there a uh, whole nut holding the blade in it's a rat tang blade double-edged and you look at this and you know exactly what it's for this is not a utility knife this is 100 percent a fighting knife um the 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 knuckle dusters have spikes on them uh the edge is double um the weight of the handle is giving you that weight I was talking about with the aluminum knuckles. Those aluminum knuckles can't come close to this. Uh, you swing this around and you can feel the weight carry your hand. So this is just an absolutely devastating uh, piece of kit. Now, historically, it did not it did not stick around for too long. Uh, how it went this was developed at the end of World War One. Basically, they they were working on it through World War One, but it uh, was developed. You know, mostly came out after World War One, as you can see from the 1918 uh, moniker on this. It was in service between uh, then and and into World War Two, and then it was replaced by the M3 trench knife, and then later, uh, and, and then the Marine Corps got the K bar. Uh, but that M3 trench knife replaced this. What it was is a similar, uh, well, not very similar at all, actually. Uh, what the M3 trench knife is, was a non-knuckle duster version of this with a bayonet style blade. So sharp for half of the top edge and the full bottom edge. 
It had a leather stacked handle with forward with a top forward facing quillion and a bottom regular straight and great for fighting, but also uh, utility. This thing, as you can tell, is not a utility knife. And they needed a something that could flex uh, from weapon to tool, weapon to tool, weapon to tool, and also something that didn't use up so much metal. Uh, this handle is solid bronze and the blade obviously is steel. And there was uh, concern about, about conserving the strategic metal uh, resources for the country. And this knife definitely uh, soaked a lot of that up. So was replaced pretty quickly and so there aren't so many of them out there like there are K-Bars, M3s, and, and other military blades because they just didn't make as many of them. So I'm very honored to have this. Thank you, Vic. I, I love you dearly, my brother. I mention him here all the time. He's got me some of the greatest things in my collection and uh, ever so grateful for them. And I'm grateful to you for tuning in and watching this, uh, me gushing over these uh, new products that I have, uh, some new, some old. Um, some I can't even call a product. This is an artifact here in my hand. Uh, but I appreciate your watching and listening and your support. Um, please be sure to join us again tomorrow night on Thursday Night Knives and come on and actually talk and meet me. That would be great. And then uh, coming up on Sunday, episode 306, we will have uh, Ben Belkin of Jack Wolf Knives. And, uh, and we will be talking to him about his creations and uh and the drop. So that'll be awesome. Uh, guys, thank you so much again. And uh, I just want to say for Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24 7 listener line at 724 466 4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the knife junkie podcast